So welcome everyone. Welcome to the HelioCon seminar series. My name is Brooke Stanislavski and I'm taking over for Rebecca as the host of this series since she'll be starting her fellowship with DOE's Solar Energy Technologies Office. We are sad to see her go, but very excited for her next role. Um, and wanted to just take a moment to thank Rebecca for starting up the seminar series and for being an incredible host uh, these past three years. So a uh, virtual applause for Rebecca. Awesome. And then as for myself, to introduce myself, I am a research scientist at NREL. I've been here for just over two and a half years. And my work involves computational modeling of wind loading of CSP collectors, um, a lot of, or part of what Shashank will be talking about today. Um, and I also do work in modeling of PV panels, wind energy, and hybrids Perfect. as well. Okay. I got my PhD at University of Utah in mechanical engineering. And before that, I was a design engineer at Siemens Energy. I am pleased to be the new host of this seminar series and looking forward to bringing in some great speakers for you all. So now back to our regular programming. Um, HelioCon is a five-year research effort led by the National Renewable Energy Lab, partnering with Sandia National Labs, the Australian Solar Thermal Research Institute, and DOE's Solar Energy Technologies Office. Uh, to develop and manage a national lab-led U.S. consortium to support research, development, validation, commercialization, and deployment of low-cost heliostats for concentrating solar power and solar thermal applications. Just a few quick notes before we get started. The seminar will be recorded and made available afterwards. Please stay muted while you are not talking. Um, feel free to put any questions you have in the chat during the presentation, and those will be answered during the Q&A. We will have about 10 to 15 minutes at the end for additional Q&A, and there you can either put your questions in the chat or unmute and ask them directly. So now I am pleased to introduce our speaker for today. Dr. Shashank Yelapantula is a senior scientist in computational science at NREL in Golden, Colorado. Shashank holds a doctorate in mechanical engineering from Stanford University. Prior to his time at NREL, he worked at GE Global Research as a research engineer. At NREL, Shashank leads a number of projects involving renewable energy, involving wind, solar, and biofuels. Recently, he has been working on characterizing the impact of wind on the structural loads and optical performance of collectors used in concentrated solar thermal power. So now I'll hand it over to you, Shashank. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Brooke, and thanks everyone for joining. <laughs> Let me share my screen and then we'll get started. Do you see my screen clearly? Yes, that's perfect. And let me know if I can get started. Or should we give a minute or so? I see people trickling in, or should I get going? It looks like, yeah, we have about 27 participants. The number seems to be plateauing. So I think you can go ahead and get started. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for this opportunity. And thank you, Brooke, for introduce introduction and inviting me for giving this talk. This is very exciting. Uh, I've, I've, I've been following HelioCon since it was set up, and, and so it's, it's a great opportunity for me to be here and present the work we've been doing. Now, I'm the one giving the talk here, but this work would not have been possible without a number of people who have listed here. And Ulrike, uh, Brooke, Gong, uh, Ulrike and Brooke were all postdocs when they started on this work, and the staff scientists here at General, Gong, Elliot, uh, a both staff scientist at Enrel. Gang has been looking at LIDAR work, and you'll see when I present those. Elliot has been doing modeling. Ashish was a part of this team, and he's left Enrel, but his, his contributions were very important. Dave Jager took care of all our wind instrumentation that we have, that will be, that I'll be showing results from. Scott, and Scott has been leading the work on the loads. Andy Skolbrook, Simon Thaw, Brian, Jerry, Tyler, and, and Mark Iverson, they've all been helping with the field campaigns. 
And of course, Mark Mijos. Mark Mijos has been behind this work from the time I've been working on wind driven loads from 2019 onward. So his contributions uh, are very important for all the work that we that I'll be presenting today. Uh, I also want to take a minute and acknowledge the funding. Uh, this was funded by the Department of Energy Solar Energy Technologies Office. And I'm, I'm grateful for the support and the guidance that I get from my TMs, Dave uh, Haas and Andrew Prescott. And I, I, it would be remiss if I don't mention their contributions to this work. They've been very supportive and very helpful in getting this going. So the motivation, and, and you might have seen this, the Helicon Roadmap uh, workshop and, and Randy Brost uh, shared all this data with me where the better wind data and understanding how to use it was one of the top uh, responses from the industry. So in this case, the Heliocon surveyed a number of industrial entities involved in CSP and asked them to allocate some fictional dollars for their research. The votes in the total is listed here from these industry survey, the survey participants. And Additionally, the CSP best practices report also highlighted the need for more wind and loads data with very high spatial and temporal resolution. Typically, what we do is we use the meteorological TMY data, which is low resolution in space and time. And what we have found that solar collectors or even PV modules, the natural frequencies around one to two hertz and resolution of an hour serves insufficient. So that served as a motivation behind this work was to generate and develop uh, wind and loads measurements on collectors. And we didn't want to do it in, in a test facility or uh, a place where the, the heliostats or the parabolic troughs were not tracked regularly. And so we wanted to do it in an operational field setting. So we wanted to study in the field, in an operational power plant, the kind of loads and the wind modulation that you tend to see. And when I'm talking about solar collectors, I'll, I'll be focusing on primarily on heliostats and parabolic troughs. I'm not, we have not been studying the Fresnel reflectors. We have been just focused on parabolic troughs and solar tower. Additionally, what we've been looking at is both the life and in terms of the static and the dynamic loading that these collectors see, and also look at optical performance. And for this, we selected two power plants uh, for the parabolic troughs. We were uh, we focused on the Nevada Solar One facility, which is right outside Vegas, 30 minutes outside Vegas. It's a parabolic trough facility. And then we also looked at the wind and loads. We are looking at it right now, wind and loads from a power tower plant, the Crescent Dunes uh, power plant. So there we have installed a number of instrumentation and we are collecting data as we speak. One other goal of this project that we undertook was to develop accurate and computationally inexpensive uh, simulation techniques. And what we've been seeing is some of the computational work that has come out has is, is looking at large scale models, models that need a supercomputer to run. But our focus was to develop computationally inexpensive models, which allow us to do deeper simulations that can be performed on your laptop and don't need a supercomputer that is typically not available to industry. And we wanted to make all of these tools open source. So I'll be discussing uh, what we have done there, what kind of results we're getting, and, and the promise that these techniques hold. So the way I'm, I've structured this presentation is first I'll talk about the parabolic troughs that we've been studying for uh, almost two years and we finished the campaign last year. Then I'll come briefly talk about the instrumentation layout and what we are doing at Crescent Dunes right now. And at the end, I'll talk more about the simulation techniques. So this is this is a big this is a picture of the Nevada Solar One. It's a seventy-two megawatt capacity, uh, full load storage, half an hour full load storage in Boulder City, Nevada. So outside Las Vegas. And here, what we did was we set up a bunch of wind instrumentation. So we had, uh, as you can see in the figure here, we had one inflowmet tower looking at on the western side of the plant. And we had three mid towers in after the first row, second row, and the third row. And then we had a LIDAR, which was mapping out the wind over these troughs. Uh, this LIDAR was placed on top of a shipping container and was scanning the region on top of these parabolic troughs. 
we performed this campaign uh, for two years where we collected data, wind data and from the inflow tower was collected continuously for two years and the loads data was collected for six months. There were gaps in when we had to pull out our wake met masts because of uh, maintenance that the plant was performing. This is a first of a kind campaign where in an operational power plant during operation, we collected wind and loads data. The data collection campaign was run for 24 seven, even while normal operation of the plant. And the schematic that you see here shows where the LIDAR was, LIDAR was here, and there were three MET towers and the inflow tower. Uh, on each of those MET towers, we had three sonic anemometers. And the way we had positioned these anemometers was a three and a half meter one was, was always shaded by the troughs and the five meter, depending upon the various orientation, was shaded or was uh, over the troughs at, at a certain point during the during the day. And the seven meter was scanning about the troughs. We had a cup anemometer at 15 meters, but I'll be, I won't be discussing the results that we see from the 15 meter cup anemometer. And the LIDAR was scanning the region right at around seven, seven and a half meters, right over where the troughs were. So around seven meters. In, this was done for the wind measurement. For the loads measurements, we had a ton of uh, instrumentation installed on three of the rows. We had drive torque, pylon bending, dynamic tilt, we had accelerometers, we had mirror vibration, and we looked at winds. And there was, of course, the wind speed. And we installed this on row one, row two, and row four. These are the MET towers. And we did it on the row four to directly correlate with the wind. Uh, that was being uh, impacting these roads. As I mentioned, uh, this data collection was run for full two years. The inflow met mass was run nonstop for uh, two years and the loads, there were certain gaps when these gaps were driven by the maintenance window, when the plant had to drive their trucks between the roads. So we had to pull out the make, make masks and put them back. LIDAR was also run uh, for the same period of two years with, with some gaps when we had to send the LIDAR for maintenance windows, but otherwise we, we have a long-term correlation of the, using LIDAR as well. As I mentioned, the loads was done for over a period of six months. And this data was collected 24-7, uh, morning, night, day, even during the operation of the plant. So yeah, this is first of a kind data set we made the, and, and that was looking at long term uh, perspective of what the wind and the loads and uh, how they were impacting the solar collectors and the parabolic troughs and their performance. We made this data open source. Uh, this data is available on OD, which is the Open Energy Data Initiative. A full terabytes or a few terabytes of data is available for anyone to download. And and they and we have also uploaded a number of uh, scripts and tools that you can use to uh, work with this data, plot, or or use it for your various applications. There's a bunch of people who have been starting to use it. We know of at least uh, one PhD student in Norway who's been looking at this data, and and a few more grad students who are interested in going and doing analysis of this data set. So. It's very exciting. If anybody is interested and, and needs more details, please reach out to us and we'll be happy to walk you through this data set. <clears throat> but this, the entire terabytes, the two years of data set, wind and loads with LIDAR, MET tower, everything's online for anybody to look at. We have published multiple papers and there's also one, a, a couple more papers which are under review or under preparation. There was a nature scientific data where we described um, this entire data set is available for anybody to look at and clearly understand what instrumentation was installed, what was the frequency of the data acquisition. We also have published a solar energy paper that came out very recently where we discussed the physical findings and the conclusions from this work and, and, and also given a future perspective of where this is going. We have a couple more papers. There's one renewable energy paper that Brooke is leading that's that's under review, looking at torsional loads. And then we have uh, one paper that is under preparation on computational models and also on the LIDARs. Okay, with that, let's jump into what is the data teaching us? 
So what we found, and this is a very simplified model that we created from, from this data set was the wind field modulation. How does the wind, let's look at a scenario where the wind is impacting, it's coming from the west and it's directly impacting the troughs head on. What we find is the upstream rows were blocking the wind. This is pretty well known and everybody knows this, this is the block body effect. But what it does is because of the blockage given by the first row, you have a vortex shedding that happens because of the boundary layer separation from the top edge of these troughs. And these forms, these vortex shedding is pretty dominant in the first few rows. And as you go further down the field, these big vortices, they break apart and form into much smaller vortices or flow, flow length scales which are much smaller than the trough size. The first row, essentially, the vortex is the same size or the same dimension as the trough aperture width. Aperture. And then, then uh, as you go further down the field, these vortices break apart and induce much more higher turbulence and unsteadiness of the response of uh, these troughs. The one other additional things that we saw was that there's a change in the wind direction with the upstream rows. What we found was even when the wind was impacting the troughs in for coming from the west, the first few rows would actually modulate and change the direction. And that induces uh, very asymmetric loads on these troughs. The trough orientation plays a big role, not only in terms of the loads, but also in terms of the turbulence uh, that is generated in the flow field between the various rows. And I'll show you briefly some of these in quite a bit of detail. So we were able to construct a pretty simplified model which shows how the wind is modulated and modified by these trough parabolic troughs. I'll also show you with the LIDAR where we were able to get a much deeper perspective where we could go half a kilometer into the plant and look at how the wind uh, is being modified there. So if you were to look at just from uh, looking at the various inflow towers and the wake masts at three and a half meters, so the sonic anemometer closer to the ground and seven meters way above the ground. And if you go further into the field, so this, the first uh, is the inflow tower, then you have three other wake masts. What you'll notice at seven meters is the pre predominantly the wind is coming from south to southwest. And that persists as you go into the field. And, and essentially, there's a blockage effect. So initially, you'll see 10 to 12 meters per second. And as, as you further go into the field, you start to see more slowdown. So even on a layer above the troughs, you see a slowdown of the wind. Now, as you go in, in, when in the shaded region, so at three and a half meters, in the height at which the troughs are completely shading the the sonic anemometer, they're these sonic is completely shaded by the troughs at all angles. You would notice that the wind going between southwest, as you would expect, at three and a half meters in flow, so undisturbed flow, is completely modulated into a 90 degree turn where the flow takes a 90 degree turn and it's mostly south to southeast. And as you go further into the plant, this seems to be recovering back and coming back to south southwest, but in the first row itself, you see a big 90 degree change in the wind direction. Now this is going to induce, and, and you'll see briefly in the next few slides is, this is going to induce a big turning moment and, and a pretty asymmetric load on the supporting structures and also the mirrors and the drives because of this flow turning. So this is something that we didn't expect initially when we started the work, but we were quite excited to see this phenomena happen. and. And, and why it happens and, and what is the primary reasoning behind it, we're still working through that. So I don't have an answer for you, but this, this is something that we, we believe is, is a big, will have a big impact on the loads seen by the troughs and the supporting structures. So if I go through, uh, let's look at the vertical wind speed profiles and also the vertical turbulent kinetic energy or the turbulent intensity, what you'll see is this, that the wind speed is blocked after the first row, which is expected. But at the hinge height, uh, we see TKE reduce. And that's also because of the mean is getting shaded and the mean wind field is also getting decreased. And that's, that leads to an increased turbulent intensity, which is an artificial, uh, increase because the mean flow is decreasing. So that's why the TI goes up. 
But what is interesting here is because turbulent intensity is used by the community to quantify the intent, the, the how much turbulence there is. And the industry uses a standard called ESDU standard. And if, if I were to compare uh, the turbulent kinetic energy or the TI, the turbulent intensity we see in the field, it is much higher than what is expected from an ESDU standard. So that's also telling us that we need to, again, start looking at this ESDU standard and see if it actually reproduces what's happening in the field. Because in our data set, it seems to uh, not clearly is not match what we see in the field. So maybe an update on the ESDU standard might be needed. If you were to look at a natural frequency and, and vortex shedding, as I mentioned, the vortex shedding, and if you focus on one angle, which is the trough angle at 60 degrees, and if you were to look at pass spectral density of the vertical wind speed at three and a half meters, so much closer to the ground, you see a peak. You peak at around 0.5 hertz. And, and that peak is not seen in the horizontal velocity or the velocity parallel to the ground at three and a half meters. It's only seen in the vertical velocity. So that's kind of showing us that there is a vortex shedding happening because of the flow separation of the top edge and that vortices have a characteristic length scale and a time scale that corresponds to somewhere of the order of 0.5 uh, hertz. If I were to look at the moments, some of the moments uh, show that peak, but most of them, there's no clear visible peak there. But if you were to look at a drag force, you would see the same peak occur occurring at 0.2 to 0 0.0 hertz frequency. So. Now, on top of that, you will see that there is a natural frequency that's showing up around 2 hertz. And that you could see in clearly all the figures. Whether you look at the moments or the drag force, uh, you would see a peak at around 2 hertz. So that's the natural frequency. Now, vortex shedding in this case is a dominant phenomenon. And, and that induces the, how the drag force is seen or also as the vertical velocity of the ground. Now I could go into a ton of more details, but I am 25 minutes in and I need to wrap up in 20 and there's a lot of material I have here. So I'm gonna quickly run through and show you big highlights. The other thing that we did was because we had a LIDAR and that LIDAR was able to scan much further into the field, we were able to set up a PPI or, or a azimuthal scan of the wind uh, using that LIDAR. So this is the kind of scan that you get. So you have a dead zone uh, where none of the wind, where the errors are much too higher and the signal to noise ratio is very low. So if you take out the dead zone, this is the kind of azimuthal scan that you get. So you could go further 10, 12, 14 rows into the field and look at how the wind field is modulated. So here, what I'm showing you, the blue is lower velocity, lower wind speeds, and the red is highest wind speeds. And these are nine different instances where the wind is coming from the west, different days, different times, where the wind is coming from the west. And I'm showing you how, at a, at a certain time instant, how does the wind field look like on a plane which is above the troughs, like seven meters. So first thing you'll notice is very close to the western edge around the first row, you see a slowdown. You see blues, pretty much lower velocity fields, very close in the first few rows. You see blue regions. But as you go further into the field, now this left box, which is this box, there's no blockage, there's no trough CS, and that's why you predominantly see all red. So that means the highest wind speed. That's the mean wind speed that we are seeing here with the inflow tower too. But now there's a curious trend here is as you go further into the field, so let's say half a kilometer into the field, you'll start to see more reds coming up. The flow is recovering. The wind flow is recovering as you go further into the field. And this is over the top of the troughs. This is not in the region which is shaded by the troughs. This is over the troughs. Even there, what you see is a slowdown and then the wind speed picking up again. And this repeats. We have looked at number of instances here. We are showing you the nine instances, but you, you, we have looked at a number of instances when the wind speed's coming from the west. You see the same trend that initially there's a slowdown, which is the blockage, even about the troughs, and then it, it recovers further into the plant. And so if you were to ensemble average all of those instances, you start to see a 20 to 25% increase in the wind speed as you go further into the plant. 
Now, what that does is it leads to an increased wind shear in the interior of the plant. So if you were to come up with, look at a model, you have an inflow coming in. These are the first few rows. There's less shear, less turning moments because the flow has slowed down. And the turning moment led by the gradient of the wind and normal to the ground is lower. But as you go further in, what you notice is the wind field over the troughs is recovering. Whereas in the within the shaded region, you still have a slowdown because this is shaded by the troughs. But now what this has done is it has led to more shear, more gradient of the wind speed normal to the ground. And so that will lead to more turning moments as you go further into the plant. Now, we have always been designing the troughs or the solar collectors with the intention that, oh, as you go further into the plant, you have more shading, you will have uh, the wind speed slows down. So you could uh, have a little bit more leeway there. But what this study, from what we are finding is, yes, the wind will slow down within the plant in the shaded region, but it will lead also with generate more shear and higher turning moments that might impact your drives, the life of the drives, and also the supporting structures that are holding these mirrors in place. So this needs to be studied further. This needs to be looked into much more deeper in terms of what happens to the turning moments much further into the plant, what happens to the wind shear into the plant. And that's our intention with the Crescent Dunes campaign where we are looking at the edge, uh, Helios starts at the edge and also much further interior to again uh, validate this. In this study, we didn't measure loads much further into the plant because of some uh, lot of logistical issues. But and for the heliostats, we want to verify that the same phenomena exists and we see it there and we can validate using the loads instrumentation that we have installed there. What we also looked at was uh, various kinds of loads. So one of the things that we studied was the dynamic tilt. So looking at we had inclinometers at three different locations in each of the rows where we had on the shared occurrence and the drive occurrence and the mid occurrence. So I'll show you what that so there's a drive motor, and then there's a shared occurrence that happens between the two modules. So there's a drive occurrence and there's a shared occurrence. So for the case of inclinometers, we had uh, at the drive, mid, and the shared. So we had 12 inclinometers on these three rows to look at what is the kind of torsion or the turning mode, the torsion that we see on each of those modules. We could also use those inclinometer data to calculate tracking error because we were able to look at the sun position based upon the location of this plant. We had a sun position and these troughs should be following the sun. So we had, uh, we at any given time, you could calculate what's the deviation from the sun position and that will, that, that will allow you to calculate the tracking error. I won't show too much of the optical performance and what this tracking error leads to, but we were able to quantify that. Now, if you were to look at uh, ray tracing or even uh, an empirical uh, as, as a analytical model to calculate what the intercept factor would be. So intercept factor here being the number of rays that hit the absorber tube uh, and the ratio of the ratio of that versus the number of tube rays that hit the collector. What you'll notice is there's a critical value. If the tracking error goes past 13.7 milli radian, the intercept factor drops sharply. It drops to like almost zero. Even in the ranges, even in the ranges where your intercept factor may be 0.9 or 0.95, you could still, because of this tracking error, you could have a very non-uniform heating of the absorber tube, which is again, not very good for the life of this absorber tube and also your heat transfer fluid. So. You may have a pretty high intercept factor, but that could still lead to very inefficient non-uniform heating of the receiver tube. Now, remember those numbers, 13.7 milliradians, and at 23, you're producing nothing. None of the rays are hitting the absorber tube, but that number is critical, 13.7 milliradians. So what we did was, because of the way these modules, there's a drive occurrence and there's a shared occurrence, what we did was we looked at torsional loads. What kind of torsional loads does these uh, troughs experience. And because they have a drive mechanism at one end and have a shared joint at the other end, they would lead to torsion. 
and these torsional forces would also lead to an angular mis misalignment and the reduced optical performance. So I'll show you in the next few slides what kind of torsional loads this trough sees and highlight the differences due to wind and the position in the array. So here, the transparent symbols are corresponding to the weak winds when the wind speeds are lower than four meters per second and the darker symbols are corresponding to the torsion in each row during stronger winds from the west. The impacts that, as you can see, are most noticeable in row one, where you would see milliradians all the way up to like 40 milliradians, where we compare the torsion between the shared occurrence and the drive occurrence. Now, we are not comparing against row, we are just comparing for each individual row, the difference between the angle of the shared occurrence was showing and also what the drive occurrence was showing. The impacts are most noticeable in row one as expected and diminish in rows two and four due to sheltering by row one. The absolute difference is significant because it, it shows the impact of wind here because you have very strong winds and the weak winds, there's a pretty strong difference. Even in row two, you could see that between the weak winds and the strong winds, you have almost a difference of 10 milliradians. As you go to row four, that number goes down. You are talking about six to seven milliradians, but still it is quite significant. Remember, anything greater than 13 milliradians would lead to almost a zero intercept factor. So that means no rays are intersecting the absorber tube in that scenario. Now, you could look at, uh, at different time instances uh, based upon which direction the parabolic trough is facing, if it's facing towards the west, towards the east, and if the wind is impacting in the backside or on the front side, and that all leads to a different behavior of the parabolic troughs. So I, I won't go into too much detail here because I have another 10 to 15 minutes and I have to cover a few more things. But if you have any more questions, please, please reach out to us. And, and Brooke did a very good analysis here. She'll be able to also tell you a little bit more about what differences the different trough positions have and the kind of torsion loads that we see. In a sense, the, the row one torsional has the, the strong westerly winds have an opposite effect on row one torsional errors when the troughs face towards versus away from the incoming wind. So the trough angle orientation matters and at, at a certain time of the day and, and on kind of torsional loads that you these troughs experience. We also looked at what, because predominantly most of the design studies in terms of the troughs or for heliostats have been based on wind tunnels. And so we wanted to see the kind of data that we're collecting, what we are seeing, how does it compare to the wind tunnel data? Does it match the wind tunnel data or the wind tunnel data under or overestimates because that information will be very useful for a future trough design to know, hey, how much to trust the wind tunnel or what kind of correction factors to apply. So we looked at the Hosoya and uh, Pitarka data where they looked at wind tunnel tests for parabolic trough collectors. This is an old report, almost 20 years old, but this is a treasure trove of data in terms of all the information that it provides. And it's been used extensively by parabolic trough designers worldwide. So we'll focus on two metrics. One is a torque moment coefficient and the drag coefficient. And we were able to generate that from our data set with the bending moment and also the drag force and the torque moment that we were measuring. And so if you look at the drag force coefficient and here the black symbols are what we measured and there's peak to peak and, and there's mean also. And then the Hosoya one it gives you the peak to peak and which is in colored in red. So if you look at just the static load, the mean loads, we match pretty well the trend that you see in the Hosoya, the wind tunnel data. Now, these are different trough angles. Now, we don't measure for all the trough angles at the same amount because there's a stow position at 120 degrees. And so we have a lot more data there. But then we circle through these trough angles on a daily basis. So you'll see, you won't see uh, in our data set anything greater than minus 100 or anything past 100 because we don't ever go to those angles. But Pitarka was able to. But in the range between sunset and sunrise and in the stove position, you can clearly see that the mean trend is pretty similar, but the peak to peak variation is very different. The NSO data, our, our data at the, from the field shows a much higher peak to peak load or more dynamic loading than what was seen in the wind tunnels. And you could look at 
the same moment coefficients and the drag coefficient at row one, row two, and also the row four, and the trend is still the same. The means, the static loading is very similar, but the dynamic loading is very different with more variation, much higher variation that's seen in the field data compared to what was seen in the uh, in the wind tunnels. So that's again a key point. If you're using the wind tunnel data to designing, there has to be a correction factor applied because we are able, we are seeing that they are under predicting the dynamic loading, which will again impact the fatigue loads and also life of these helios, the parabolic drops. So I'm gonna quickly jump and spend like five minutes on the work we're doing on the heliostats, where we have a measurement campaign that's ongoing at Crescent Dunes. Uh, our goal is here to do a six months from one side, which is the north northwest. That's where the predominant wind direction is, is in the north northwest at this plant. So we wanted to undertake a six month campaign here, focusing on the north northwest. And in in this the new project that we just started, we'll move after those six months to on the other side and south southeast and look at not just the interior loads or the edge loads, but also get uh, a LIDAR in at the center near the tower and map out a wide region to look at what kind of winds that we see, what is the modulation, uh, modification of these winds by the heliostats. So we're measuring loads on three heliostats, two at the edge, right at the edge of the plant, and then one much further into the plant, 10 to 12 rows further interior, to see if, what kind of differences that we see in the wind and all the loads on these uh, heliostats. So right now we have uh, three mid towers that we have installed at this plant. Where is the? Is there a question? Okay, there is just okay. So we have an inflow mid tower which is right at the edge of the plant, the north northwest side, and then we have three heliostats that we have identified here. One is at the edge and one's just further interior. And then all the way at, at least 12 to 14 rows further in here, we have another heliostat that we have instrumented. And we have three MET towers measuring winds, and these are various sonic anemometers at three different heights, uh, looking at the undisturbed flow coming into the plant, if it's coming from the north-northwest, and also looking at what is the wind that is hitting these uh, heliostats. And we have two towers in the upstream that we have installed, and we've been collecting data. We also have a LIDAR that's, uh, that we have installed in the heater bay very close to the tower that is mapping out the wind over these heliostats all the way to the edge, all the way to like three kilometers out. And we are now focused using this LIDAR in the north northwest corner. And so that's where we are mapping. And we're doing both the vertical scans. So get a profile of wind as a function of height of the ground and also horizontal scans where we do an azimuthal horizontal scan, 90 degree scan uh, in the north northwest. To give you a sense of the data that's coming out, this is uh, 15th and 16th of September. So very recent data where we looked at uh, so this is where the LIDAR is, is situated and there's a 90 degree helio, the, the azimuthal scan that it does. And this was uh, in the midnight, at around midnight uh, local time, where the wind speed that we measured at the Met Tower at, at, was four and a half meters and the wind direction was northwest at around 325 degrees, where you will see these patches of very high wind speeds, but this is way above the heliostats. This is on the heater bay. This is this is, I think, 35 meters off the ground, but no heliostats. The heliostats, the top edge is around 10 to 11 meters off the ground. So this is way over the heliostat uh, field of view. So we are mapping out region way above, but you still see quite a bit of slow moving flow structures and faster moving flow structures. There's quite a bit of uh, non-uniformity in the spatial domain. Now, we could do the vertical scan where we scan uh, at 330 degree angle. So we stop the laser head at a certain angle and scan it, uh, the wind speed normal to the ground. That's where I think some of the interesting behavior you'll see is if you look at the wind coming from the Northwest and this is uh, mapping all the way to 200 meters off the ground, what you'll see is an alternating pattern of slow moving, fast moving, slow moving, fast moving, like a wavy nature of the wind feed. 
And that, I believe, is coming because of the rows of heliostat that we have, that you have flow sh shaded, and then you have a faster moving flow because of uh, mass and momentum conservation, and you'll see these behaviors. Now, at night time, uh, at, at five o'clock in the afternoon, the wind is coming from the southeast, so in the opposite direction, and you start to see, because of that, you still see these slow and fast moving structures, but they're oriented in the opposite direction. That's because the wind is coming from the other direction. And here also you see quite a bit of uh, slow moving structures and fast moving structures. Now, some of this could also be because of the flow separation happening of the tower. And why is it going back and forth? Okay. Uh, the flow separation happening of the tower. So during a course of one day, you could see data from coming from various different directions. And so we are sitting and analyzing all of this data and we'll, we'll give you more insights in the coming year on analyzing this data and look at what kind of flow structures are influenced, uh, the flow structures that are generated from the heliostats and how do they influence a uh, plane of view much farther above the ground. We, as I mentioned, we have loads instrumentation also installed. So this is like a Christmas tree. We have three heliostats fully decked out with strain gauges, accelerometers, inclinometers, uh, rotary encoders. We have pressure differentials. Uh, so pressure on the front facing and the back facing of the heliostats in three different locations. As I mentioned, in, in clean up, uh, we have accelerometers also looking at acceleration that is seen by these heliostats. So we have two at the edge and then one further interior collecting data. So we are still analyzing this data set and there's a whole host of data that we're generating that we haven't fully analyzed, but in the coming year, we'll develop it, this all of this into a data set, just like what you saw in the troughs and we'll make it open source for everybody to look at and we'll publish all the conclusions from this study. As I mentioned, I wanna take one quick five minutes so that I'll leave 10 minutes for some questions and uh, wanted to quickly highlight some of the simulation work we're doing. So this is a work that I did in 2019 where I looked at a six row parabolic trough, large eddy simulation, very, very detailed analysis, uh, much higher resolution in space and time. And we found some of the key characteristics that I just highlighted, drag force highest in row one, decreases further downstream, but the moments are much higher in the downstream rows with a higher unsteady variation. And the edge effects are very critical. So something similar to what you had seen. But this simulation needed something like 120 million CFD cells. So CFD, computational fluid dynamics, 100 million cells, mesh cells. And the entire simulation to compute eight seconds of the flow needed 3.2 million CPU hours on the one of the largest supercomputers that EERE has. So this is not usable by the industry. Uh, if you need a supercomputer to do all your design calculations, then it will just take freaking forever and you won't get where you want it to go. So what we uh, took up as a task was to reduce the computational expense. We wanted to reduce it to a point where somebody could use their workstation or their laptop to do these CFD calculations and do some design analysis. And to do that, we relied on a technique called actuator force modeling. Now, this is a technique that's being used for decades now in modeling uh, wind energy, wind turbines, and the rotor blades flow past the rotor blades. And the this concept was developed as a part of that. And so what we did was we adapted that where you don't reproduce physically the rotor blades in this case, or the heliostat, or the parabolic troughs, but you reproduce, we approximate them using force points where the force gives you the response of uh, these, the, the flow response given a certain wind speed. So once you have that force response as a, so like a drift, like a drag coefficient or a lift coefficient as a function of various uh, angles of attack or the wind speeds, you could use that as a lookup table. And given a certain local wind speed, you could calculate what the forces would be and you apply that to your continuous medium. Now, what we needed to do was the new challenges for the solar collectors because it's a thin body, aerodynamics was not completely known a priori and highly separated flows. But we were able to resolve all of those issues and we were able to develop a simple actuator force modeling based technique that we were able to study a flow past a simple heliostats. 
Now, this is an isolated collector at a 60 degree angle. We needed something like 650,000 cells. Compare that to 120 million. The entire 10 seconds of simulation just was done on 22 minutes of wall time. So this, this is definitely possible. This can be run uh, on a laptop. So we, what we saw was a 1100 times speed up. So massive speed up. In terms of how it compared with the wind tunnel studies. So if you look at the University of Adelaide wind tunnel where they had looked at a full elevation angle sweep, we compared our simulations predictions and they match the lift and the drag coefficient really well over a range of uh, elevation angles. So not only the model is accurate, uh, but also is computationally inexpensive. For instance, this each uh, of this uh, elevation angle needed like nine CPU hours on a laptop. So essentially a massive 5,000 times speed up compared to the body fitted mesh that I first showed you. We simulated the same six rows that I showed you at first, but using this technique, the actuator technique, we had a six row trough set up. And what we did was here, we compared it against the measurements that we were making at Nevada Solar One. And so look, looking at the NSO median data for drag coefficient as a function of row one, row two, and row four, our simulation results are very close to what we measured at NSO. So this technique is not only computationally inexpensive, but is also very accurate. We have made this open source. Anybody can download it and start using it on their laptops. Over the last year, Brooke has been leading a lot of the work looking at in those in those simulations, the, the troughs or the heliostats were all rigid bodies, but we have now started to look at simulations of the structural response given a certain wind uh, profile. So Brooke has been leading this work where she's been looking at a deforming heliostat and simulating that and looking at strong and weak wind conditions. For the heliostat that we have at Crescent Dunes, what we found was a two hertz uh, natural frequency where the dominant frequency was seen. And that is very similar to what we measure from our accelerometer data as well. Now we will look into studying the optical performance of this given this kind of oscillations in, in the coming year and try to quantify that against and compare that against experiments. So that brings me to the last in the conclusion slide. And what I want to leave you with this is, this is the first of a kind uh, measurements that we're doing on wind-driven loads and deformations of collector surface at two different operational power plants, both for heliostats and also troughs. We uh, started with the parabolic troughs and we have developed a model and we have wind, we showed how it compares against the wind tunnel studies, showed higher torsional load and poor optical performance on the edge rows. We're trying to do a similar exhaustive comprehensive uh, analysis and measurement campaign at Crescent Dunes, where we are looking at uh, wind-driven loads and heliostats. And we also are planning to do in the coming years, a smaller set of heliostats, similar kind of tests that are being installed at the Admiral's Flat Islands campus. With that, uh, thanks again for all, all, all your time and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thanks so much, Shashank. Wonderful talk. So yeah, as he mentioned, now um, it is time for Q&A. So feel free to either chat or send your questions over through the chat, or you can unmute and directly ask the questions yourself. Hey, Brooke, this is Mark. I guess I could, ask, I could ask a question. Um, if so, two two questions, Shashank, maybe or, or your team. One is um, if somebody else were try, going to try to replicate your work, whether it's the CFD or the site studies, or or the other studies, what what's the what? How would you caution them? What mistakes did you make initially that um, you would want to warn others against? So the first thing I'll say is don't focus too much on the edges of the plant. I would say try to focus more on the interior. We all know that the edge rows are, they have very poor optical performance. They uh, they suffer from a lot of wind-driven loads. Now, we, when we started the campaign on troughs, we were focused on the edge rows on the western side. But I believe after spending two years on this, is don't focus too much on that. Focus more on the interior. Go further interior. 
The second thing I'll tell you is work closely with the power plant. Because in terms of the optical performance, we were using inclinometers. So we had a very good idea of where, what position the troughs were. And now in the case of heliostats, we have a pretty good idea of where the heliostats are pointing. But until and unless you have the data that the control room is seeing, you don't know if the control room is seeing the same trough orientation or how off it is. And what is the optical performance because of that? Until and unless you have, let's say the heat transfer fluid temperature in the case of parabolic troughs, Till you have that data, you can't corroborate what you're seeing on your tracking error or in the case of slope errors and, and how that impacts on the optical performance. So I would say work closely with the power plant if you're doing a similar kind of study to get that data, the SCADA data, the data that the control room is seeing. And that would be, and then you'd be able to clearly identify what is the optical performance and what's the impact of this wind-driven loads and optical performance. Those are the two things that I would say upfront. There's there's more there's more to discuss as you go into the details as devil is in the details, but these would be the two things I'll say upfront. Okay. Any other questions? I had my second question. Sure. So, so you've done the work for heliostats and troughs. You mentioned linear Fresnel, um, you know, and one of the benefits potentially of linear Fresnel are the lower wind loads and lower to the ground. Has anybody from the linear Fresnel community reached out to you? No, no. The the other other place in the troughs world, what the thing that Glass Point is doing, where they have a full enclosure. Yeah. Where I, I believe they did this because they don't have to worry about any of the wind driven loads. We 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 showed all of this data to Gerhard and he was really interested as and but he never told me if this his interest is from a more academic standpoint and he wants to know more or is Glass Point interested in any of this because he never told me that. So I don't know. Mm -hmm. But nobody from the Lena Fresnel has reached out. Okay. Any others? I'm not seeing any in the chat, um, but I have one. Oh. Shishu, what do you think is the most interesting or the most important question that still remains open on the topic of wind loading in CSP? Quantifying the dynamic loads. Because I feel like most of the design work that's being done on the newest troughs or the heliostats or traditionally has been done with static loads and applying a correction factor on top of that. But looking at dynamic loads, what is the dynamic loading? What impact it has on a longer term fatigue or a longer term life of these collectors? That I think is still pretty unknown and something that I would like to focus on and look at. And again, as, as mentioned before, People haven't studied in an operational setting the optical performance of this given a wind-driven loads. And that is something I'd like to quantify in the coming years as to what is the impact? How many milliradians are we missing from rows which are further off at the edge or in the interior on a very windy day or a not a windy day? And some of the work that University of Adelaide has done is looking at store strategies and coming up with better store strategies once you know the optical performance, once you know the life and the dynamic loading. So there's, there's a lot to be parsed out from this data yet. And I think that would be our goal for the next year, few years. Thank you. Okay, if there's no other questions. Looks like there's one in the chat. I from... was expecting Randy to say something. <laughs> I can go ahead and read it out loud. So Randy says, unlike troughs, heliostats have short apertures and significant gaps between them. Could you elaborate on the lateral torsional effects that might arise? How about fluid structure interactions introduced by alternate or lateral vortex shedding? So Randy, that's a good question. And, and I'll, I'll answer it. So in, in a different way, we've been measuring wind uh, and, and some of the initial analysis that we are seeing is, 
between the undisturbed inflow tower and the first row of tower, there's not much of a shading or a reduction happening. That's because you have a lot more significant gaps between them. So the wind is gushing through that and trying to accelerate. And so we're not seeing that much of a slowdown. But as you go further into the field, we are seeing quite a bit of shading because of these heliostats. And that's because we went so far in and there's so much blockage coming from, let's say, 10, 12 rows of these heliostats at Crescent Dunes that you start to see uh, more slowdown. Now, some of our initial analysis is showing is that as you go further in, you have more turbulence generation because of the flow separation coming off these edges, and that induces unsteady moments. So the, I would anticipate more, less, more reduction of the drag force as you go further in, but definitely more uh, torque moments, more bending moments of the structures, more unsteadiness in those uh, loads as you go further into the plant. So I would anticipate lateral torsional effects to be quite high further into the plant than at the edge. I would expect that. Now, fluid structure interactions introduced by the alternate vortex shedding. Now, I don't have an answer for you now, but once I go through our data set, I'll be able to give you more about what kind of vortex shedding we see, what kind of uh, length scales that we see uh, in the flow much further into the plant, right at the edges, and their impact on the stresses and strains that these structures see. We have instrumentation, we've been collecting data, so uh, we just have to process it. We spend all this time analyzing the troughs. We are now starting to get into the heliostats too. Yes, more to come. Um, we are about out of time, so let's thank Shashank again for the talk. And I have some wrap-up material to go over. So <laughs> as you all know, um, the... Past seminar presentations are available on our website, which is shown here, um, as well as additional resources about Heliostats and CSP. Um, if you'd like to subscribe to the seminar series or get in touch, our email is shown below. And I'm pleased to announce our next Heliocon seminar, which will be held on October 23rd um, uh, by Mo Tian from Arizona State University. So thanks again, everyone. and. Uh, we will see you next time.